once a person enters the gates of hell, dear friend, here's the saddest part of hell. There will be no return. There will be no second chances. Contrary to the new false doctrines that are swirling about all across this country and around the globe, hell is eternal. Make no mistake about it. Don't doubt it. If you die unsaved, if you die without Jesus Christ, dear friend, you will spend an eternity in hell. There is no place else to go. There will be no second chance. There is no more hope, no more grace, no more mercy, no more gospel, no more preachers, and yes, no more God for you. Once a person is in hell, he will be locked in forever. And to me, that has got to be the most horrifying aspect of hell. To back that up, allow me to read a portion of the great professor, the great uh, Dallas Theological Seminary professor, John F. Walvert, on this subject. He said these words. Can eternal punishment be harmonized with the love and grace of God? His answer was yes. He went on to say, some who concede that the Bible teaches eternal punishment nevertheless say that this concept is alleviated by the fact that God is a God of love and a God of grace. As the evidence unfolds on the eternity of punishment of the lost, it becomes clear that the objections to it are not, watch it, watch it now, that the objections to it are not exegetical, but theological. This illustrates the centuries-long tension between theology or a system of interpretation and biblical exegesis. If exegesis is the final factor, he said, eternal punishment is the only proper conclusion taken at its face value. The Bible teaches eternal punishment. This observation is supported by the fact that many who reject eternal punishment also reject the inerrancy and accuracy of the Bible and even reject the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, Pius quotes Theodore Parker in his two sermons, I believe that Jesus Christ taught eternal punishment. I do not accept it on his authority. One is faced with the fact that the only place one can prove absolutely that God is a God of love and grace is from Scripture. If one accepts the doctrine of God's love and grace as revealed in the Bible, how can that person question, then, that the same Bible teaches eternal punishment. I want to repeat that. If one accepts the doctrine of God's love and grace as revealed in the Bible, how can that person question then that the same Bible teaches eternal punishment? One more time. If one accepts the doctrine of God's love and grace as revealed in the Bible, the word of God, how can that person question then that the same Bible teaches eternal punishment? The problem here is, he, he goes on to say, 
is the obvious lack of understanding of the infinite nature of sin as contrasted to the infinite righteousness of God. One more time. I must repeat this. Dr. John F. Walbert of Dallas Theological Seminary said, the problem here is the obvious lack of understanding of the infinite nature of sin as contrasted to the infinite righteousness of God. And this is a very serious point. If the slightest sin is infinite in its significance, then it also demands infinite punishment as a divine judgment. Though it is common for all Christians to wish that there was some way out of the doctrine of eternal punishment because of its inexorable and unyielding revelation of divine judgment, one must rely in Christian faith on the doctrine that God is a God of infinite righteousness as well as infinite love, while on the one hand he bestows infinite grace on those who trust him. He must, on the other hand, inflict eternal punishment on those who spurn his grace. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. End of quote by Dr. John Walbert of Dallas Theological Seminary. Yes, no more gospel, no more preachers, no more Jesus Christ, no more witnesses knocking on your door, no more people standing on the corner trying to give you a gospel track, no more God, no more salvation opportunities for you once you enter into the gates of hell. Now, friend, listen, as I read a poem that someone wrote a while back, which gives a very vivid description of this place called hell. It goes like this. Hell, the prison house of despair. Here are some things that won't be there. No flowers will bloom on the banks of hell. No beauties of nature we love so well. No comforts of home, music, and song. No friendship of joy will be found in that throng. No love, nor peace, nor one ray of light. No blood-washed soul with face beaming bright. No loving smile in that region of night. No mercy, no pity, no pardon, nor grace. No water, O oh God, what a terrible place. The pangs of the lost, no human can tell. Not one moment's peace, there is no rest in hell. Hell, hell, the prison house of despair, here are some things that will be there. Fire and brimstone are there, we know, for God and his word have told us so. Memory, remorse, suffering, and pain, weeping and wailing, but all in vain. Blasphemers, swearers, haters of God, Christ rejectors while here on earth trod, murderers, gamblers, drunkards, and liars will have their part in the lake of fire. The filthy, the vile, the cruel, and mean, what a horrible mob in hell will be seen. Yes, more than humans on earth can tell are torments and woes of eternal hell. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a place of no return. The question remains, dear friend, do we as Christians, do you as a person who is not saved, do we all believe it? If so, as Christians, there ought to be a difference in our lives. There are two injunctions that our Savior gave us to follow. They are found in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. He says, Ye are the light of the earth. But if the salt have lost its... Uh, I'm sorry. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savour, 
wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The key word in this passage is let. This word let denotes that we have the light, but it is up to us to let it shine. And there are many ways that we can keep our light from shining. We as Christians many times keep the light from shining because of our sin, because of our foolishness, our worldliness, and our indifference. What is it with you, dear Christian friend? Is there a sin in your life that you are not willing to repent of? Is it your worldly attitude and demeanor? Is it your coldness, your indifference to the things of God? What is it that is keeping your light from shining? Whatever it is, you need to get it right with the Lord because people are watching us, people are watching you and I, and we need to be in a position to help pull them out of the fire. If we believe there is a literal burning hell like we say we do, we as Christians need to live like there is a hell. We need to let our light shine. We need to truly be the salt of the earth. And then in light of the fact of the reality of hell, there is something else our Lord wants us to do, and that is found in Matthew twenty-eight nineteen to 24 You know it, and you know it well. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. I know that this is not anything profound. I know that this is nothing new, but this is what we need to hear. It is a shame and a pity that we get so familiar with the word of God and the things of God that we don't even obey God anymore. In light of the awful fact of hell, you and I ought to get back to the old-fashioned business of soul winning. You call it whatever you want to call it, witnessing, sharing, whatever, but we need to get back to it. Because whether we can conceive it in our finite minds or not, those who die without Jesus Christ all around us will spend eternity in a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched.